thank you for the kind introduction. Um, it's an honor to be here today and it's all of you as we grapple with finding a path to free Palestine by examining the historical context, the implications of the ongoing conflict, especially the recent escalation of violence with an effort to craft actions have reached those goals. I want to start by giving a brief introduction of who I am. I'm a third generation Palestinian Christian refugee. My grandparents, parents from both sides, fled Yaffa and Lud at the brink of the 1948 Nakba. And like hundreds of thousands of others, they were not allowed to go back to their homes. I am here today in that capacity. A Palestinian who has experienced intergenerational conflict and trauma. Throughout my upbringing in Palestine, I experienced uprisings, wars, invasions, as well as periods of illusory hope for peace, justice, and reconciliation. I am a certified Kenyan nonviolence trainer, where I carry nonviolence values through all my interpretations of injustice, inequality, and dehumanization of all. While I denounce violence in all its forms, I recognize the inalienable rights of Palestinians to self-determination and the right to visit the array of patients both guaranteed by international law. I'm also the co-chair of the Board of Trustees of Friends of Civil Law in America, an organization that leverages liberation theology to amplify the voices of Palestinians, specifically Palestinian you will hear today from several voices who will provide context, review facts, and offer reflections about the situation. From their lived experiences to their reflections, I hope that you will approach the community, panels and workshops with an open mind and heart, an appreciation of the vulnerability it takes from all of us to express our thoughts, frustration, and hopes for a better future. Since October 7th, Anyone speaking on behalf of or in advocacy of Palestinian rights had to respond to the question of do you condemn Hamas? As a condition for even thinking and talking about the issue, and someone with a proof of their humanity, yet unfortunately without an equivalent position to any pro Israel speaker or commentator. Such rhetoric is rooted in a system that demonizes Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims, brown and black people as uncivil, animals, bloodthirsty, angry monsters, all of which continue to be used as moral justifications with the further injustice and turn a blind eye to the historical context and the systemic oppression that they have endured for years, decades, and centuries. This rhetoric, in my view, is dangerous and unacceptable. It excuses selective application of humanism in one group over another, and it stems from deep-seated stereotypes, whereby one people's humanity is perceived more worthy than the other. I am struck with puzzlement of the continuing war-mongering narrative of politicians, journalists, and individuals who denounce the killing of Israeli civilians and use that as a cognitive shield to incite and support the genocide, displacement, and eventual famine of over two million people in Palestine. The situation continues to escalate. Over 33,000 Palestinians have been killed, more than 76,000 wounded, nearly 2 million people internally displaced, starved, and plagued by disease and illnesses that are left untreated. While the loss of life and livelihood is devastating, the situation of the living is what keeps me up most nights since October 7. Three scenes have not escaped my mind. First, Deals with reports of children dying of cardiac arrest from post traumatic stress disorder. The second scene is that of mothers rewashing used disposable baby diapers and hanging them to dry for reuse. And the third one is the acronym given to countless dozen children WCNSF, Wounded Child, Known Surviving Family. My colleagues today are going to reflect on the historical, political, and social context of where we are now. I want to focus on examining the situation from a psychological perspective to find an answer of how could they do this. What we're observing today in Israel and Palestine, 
as well as the divided and often polarized response from around the world is nothing short of how human nature can be to cruel. In the wake of World War II, social psychologists attempted to answer the question of how could they, regarding the atrocities committed by Germans and their allies against the Jewish population, resulting in the Holocaust. One specific study, study, now part of the repertoire of teaching research ethics, stands out as a framework to interpret the current situation. Clarify, I am not here to draw parallels nor comparisons. I'm simply using theory to explain human behavior. <clears throat> this study is infamously referred to as the Sanford Prison Experiment. Philip Zimbardo transformed his lab into a prison and recruited a few dozen men who were randomly assigned to play the role of a prison guard or a prisoner. In a few days, guards and prisoners assumed their roles. Guards became aggressive with the prisoners. The prisoners revolted. Guards responded with more intense aggression. One could say it ignited a cycle of aggression. Similarly, Palestinians and Israelis have no other choice but to assume their roles as occupied and occupier, respectively. Luckily, the experiment was stopped after Zimbardo's then-girlfriend, Christina Maslach, made him aware of its troublesome psychological impact. In 2007, Zimbardo wrote a book called The Lucifer Effect as a response and clarification to what we have, thus explaining how good people can turn evil and perform acts of evil. He argues that evil is not necessarily the culprit of bad apples, but rather bad barrels. He defines evil as the exercise of power to intentionally harm psychologically, hurt physically, and or destroy morally and commit crimes against humanity. There are three ways in which human characters can change to the worse. Dispositional, stemming from the inside of individuals, what he terms as the bad apples, Situational or the external factors, the bad barrel, and systemic dealing with broad influences, political, economic, and evil power, termed as the bad barrel makers. The success of the bad barrel makers in transforming good people into those who commit atrocities and war crimes lies in what Zimbardo argues where the slippery slope of communities. And this slippery slope started 75 years ago in historic Palestine and has been spiraling since October 7th. Zimbardo identified seven indicators of the evil transformation that can be applied to understanding the situation both in Gaza and the West Bank. First, mindlessly stepping into a new or strange environment. The Hamas attack presented a new and strange environment for the Israeli government, military, and society. It has shaken the imbalance of power in an unprecedented way at least since 1970. Second, dehumanizing others. We've seen, we continue to see how Palestinians are continuously dehumanized. The third and fourth uh, indicators is the deindividuation of self and diffusion of personal responsibility. Israel's refusal to their responsibility as an apartheid state for the deteriorating and devastating humanitarian conditions for the past 75 years and more critically, the past two decades of Gaza blockade continues and has become not only a marker of Israeli policy, but the narrative of the pro-Israel Western world. Fifth and sixth, blind obedience to authority and uncritical conformity, which can be used to explain how individuals are ordered and blindly conformed to inflicting collective punishment of Palestinians. Finally, and most probably most worrisome, is the passive tolerance of bad behavior through inaction or indifference. And in this case, the passive tolerance of this genocide, both within Israel and outside. Not only through inaction or indifference, but also through allied military support by Israel's friends, including the United States. All these explanations of human psychology of evil are predictors of the human catastrophe we are witnessing in real time on our phones and TV sets. Amid the despair resulting from such realization, I do have hope, I try. So does Zimbardo, who dedicated the last chapter of his book to discuss how heroes can change course. 
The hero in the Stanford prison experiment was Christina Massa, who showed Zimbardo the evil that the manufactured system, prison system created. I do have hope that we can all be Christinas, that the government of the United States and other countries be the Christina in this scenario. And firmly, both in words and policy, put an end to this by calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire with the release of the hostages, and in no simpler words, stop supplying this genocidal war with weapons that have destructed the people and their homes and livelihood for generations to come. My hope is that our collective moral consciousness will enable us as people and governments to look at this issue from a systemic view of the root causes of the violence rather than getting fixated on the symptoms. Peace will never be achieved without justice. And justice can only be realized when people are free from occupation and appetite. Attempts for the past 30 years have failed to achieve that amid continuing escalation. Illegal land theft through building of Israeli settlements, robbing Palestinians of their resources, utter destruction of any possibility of self-determination of governments, governance for the Palestinians, and the worsening of the humanitarian situation that continues to deprive Palestinians of their dignity and right to exist. The mask on Israel's atrocities has been lifted for good. There is no way to justify it. The magnitude of killing and suffering, there really isn't. I hope that we approach our time together today with an open mind to understanding the context. I hope that we can reframe our thinking today in line with Palestinian authors, Uriba Uti's plea to refrain from starting the context with second. In his book, I Saw Ramallah, by Ruti states, it is easy to blur the truth with a simple linguistic trick. Start your story from second. Start your story from secondly, and the world will be turned upside down. Start your story with secondly, and the arrows of the Native Americans transform them into the original criminals, and the guns of the white men make them entirely the victims. It is enough to start with secondly for the anger of the black man against the white to be barbarous. Start with secondly and Gandhi becomes responsible for the tragedies of the British. So I leave you with a plea trying to start today with first as a means of aligning our actions with our intent to realize freedom and justice for Palestinians. Thank you.